OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Welcome to Making Materials Accessible for the EL Civics Exchange. We're glad to see you here this morning, very early. Somebody already dropped out. Okay. <laughs> Talking about birds too much, I think. Um, <laughs> my name is Margaret Teske. I'm with the Casas uh, as a program specialist. And we have with us, go ahead, Portia. I'm Portia LaFerla, also a program specialist for Casas. And in the background somewhere is David Espinoza. He's um, a very helpful colleague at OTAN who works with the EL Civics Exchange as well. We also have Penny Pearson in the room who retired and is somehow reappearing after <laughs> retirement. <laughs> keep saying, like a bad penny. <laughs> no, like a good penny. <laughs> so um, I posted the uh, PowerPoint in the chat. It's in a tiny URL, but it's also linked here, which is the proper way to do it when you do accessibility. Okay. And there's a QR code if you would like that. Okay, uh, today we're going to be giving you a quick summary of the submission to the EL Civics Exchange. Sandra Watts just did that this morning, if you were with her earlier. Then we're going to talk quickly about what is 508 compliance. When we say that, what does that mean? And we're going to talk through Word and accessibility in Word, and then PowerPoint and accessibility in that, and then some further resources. So to start with, a uh, quick summary. Now, uh, I don't know how many people are in the room. Can somebody tell me that? It's conference? just me and your monitor at the moment. Okay. So I think you guys know where that is and where to go, but um, the link is there. I was going to show that, but I don't need to. So cool. <laughs> it's in the PowerPoint. Um on the exchange, it's easy to get to the begin the submission process by just clicking on the blue button, logging in or creating an account, and then log in. There's a quick two page submission info that you need to put in and upload your document. Then you'll get notification of approval or possibly needs improvement, and that's emailed to you directly. Okay. So what is 508 compliance? I'm making it very simple here because I don't wanna overwhelm people, but it's just really help for those with disabilities. And so we have to think what a visually impaired person might see or not see when they're looking at something like a Word document and a PowerPoint. So if they really are blind, they really can't see much. So they have to rely on audio audio cues. So that's something we need to think about when we're dealing with accessibility. And, you know, they can't see the pictures. So what do they do? We'll talk about that. And then all the submitted materials need to be licensed for sharing using Creative Commons. Um, it is an attribution for non-commercial share alike. So um, it's called CC by NCSA. And that's the attribution that we require for submitting to the exchange. And we do that because we don't want it to be commercial materials. We can't um, share teacher to teacher, that kind of thing, or um, share for any kind of game, commercial game. But we also want to make it so that people can reuse it and make it maybe um, more to what they need locally, okay? So for instance, um, maybe Mount Sac has materials that include Walnut, their local city or area, but they wanna use it in Sacramento. So they in Sacramento, they're gonna add different hospitals, different schools that they have in that area to the EL Civics materials that are on the uh, EL Civics Exchange, okay? And as we go through this, if you have any questions, please ask. And we will also help you at any time with any information about this. OTAN, CASAS are very helpful 
in this regard. So, Margaret, would you mind going to presentation screen on your PowerPoint? It might be easier for our online folks to see it. Well, see, here's the problem. Um, okay. I'm using this because we're going to be talking about how to uh, make materials accessible okay. using PowerPoint. So that's Perfect. why I'm in this mode. Okay. But, but uh, probably Portia will be going in the next slide to her um, to more of the okay. screen mode. Okay. And Portia, you're on next. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing. No. Oh. Could you go back to the PowerPoint, Margaret? I'm sorry. Just go, just go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> yes. Is that it? No. Okay. So go ahead to the next slide. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about accessibility in Word, and I'm going to use two documents, one that is um, not accessible and one that I edited to make accessible. And then at the end of the workshop, I will give you both of those documents and my notes so that um, you can go back and review and kind of play with them as your um, uh, learning materials. And um, it, these are some of the common issues that we'll be dealing with. Um, there are more, there are things we won't even talk about, things like color contrast, which are really important, but this is a pretty short workshop and this is already um, a massive amount of information. So I don't expect anybody to remember everything the first time you see it. And that's why I'll, I'll, I'll give you these notes. And hopefully this video will become um, available. We don't know, but we're hoping it will become available. So um, let's see, just if you go to the next one, Margaret. Yeah. And this is just how to turn on the accessibility checker, which I'm going to show you. And then if you just scroll quickly through the next slides, these are some of the things that I'm going to demonstrate, and these notes are here within the PowerPoint so that you can review. And a lot of these notes come from the Microsoft Word support, and there is a link to that in um, OTAN under their accessibility um, resources. So if you can just scroll, so there's alternative text, and there is a link to MS Office support that you can use. They're like two-minute how-to videos, and they are fabulous. And between what, Peggy, what Penny and David taught me and those videos, I'm very much self-taught except for their assistance. And it is doable and it kind of gets to be fun after a bit. Um, and this is just about uh, useful hyperlinks and we'll talk about that within the documents. And how to set tabs and make lines and creating header rows, columns, line spacing. And I think that's it. And that's it. Yeah. Okay. So, so all those are there for, word. for you for word. Yeah. All of those are there for you. And um, they're the issues that I'll, I'll demonstrate in these two documents now. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. And um, someone shared in the chat about the accessibility links for OTAN. So, and thank you. Thank you, Penny. Okay, so you should be seeing two documents side by side here. Mm -hmm. um, and the document on this side is not an accessible document. The document on this side is an accessible document. And what I'm gonna do is walk you through this and show you how I know that. Well, I know it because I did the work, but anyway, if you go up here where it says review, it, you can click on this where it says check accessibility and that will open the accessibility checker for you. If I open it on this side, if you notice, I have quite a few errors. I have 17 plus 17 that must be fixed plus these warnings about checking the reading order. If I do the same thing on this side, I go to review, check accessibility, no accessibility issues are found. <clears throat> So that's because this is the edited document. As we go through the presentation, you can stop me at any time. I'm going to go pretty fast just because it's a short um, period of time that we have for this. But when I look at this document, um, I'm also going to use one other resource. Let me go to home again. And it's under paragraph and it's this little P and this shows formatting. So if I look at this document, you see all these little P's here? That means somebody used the enter bar to create space. And we want to avoid doing that because a screen reader is going to read that. 
If I do the same thing on this side under paragraph, you have to go to home first and then paragraph and I turn it on. I have this one little one and I just couldn't get rid of that one, but I don't have a lot of them. So um, that's one thing that we'll look at later. Um, but I just wanted to show you this paragraph marking and how, how useful it is when you're trying to format documents. So I'm gonna turn it off right now because I don't need it. And then- Portia, Portia yeah. when, when they're reading, when the reader is reading it, will it say like um, naturalization process paragraph, end of paragraph, or does it just go to the next one? No, it will read that every time. Okay. Yeah. So the, there's another difference between these two documents. This document was formatted manually. So if I click around here, you notice it's just I used the font and I used font size to create all of this. But in this one, you see these little corners that appear when I click on it? These little things here, these are what are called styles. And when you format documents, you should use this in Microsoft Word. It's called styles, it's right here. And what styles will do is give the document a structure that um, helps, the, it's a structure for the screen reader that helps the person who's listening. So all of those headers, for example, the, these things that are um, header rows at different levels, the person who's using the screen reader can scroll through those and decide what parts they want to listen to or not. And there are other functions as well. And using styles is really easy. So I don't have to retype any of this. I'm just gonna turn on styles here by clicking down here. And notice that I have all of these different levels. I'm gonna put my cursor here and I want this to be a header one. And now it's a header. This is actually part of that header. So I'm gonna click it again. And then this part here is just body text. It's, it's just information. Once I've done that, if I don't like what I've done, um, I, can, I can copy this and I can hover over styles here and I can change it. I can decide I like a different style better. Be careful of using italics, all caps, and colors because those things make it harder for a screen reader. I'm gonna stick with what I have here um, but I think this text is too small, so I can go ahead and edit that and make it bigger. Well, that just made all of it bigger, which is fine, but I can just make this part bigger if I want to, and I can make it bold or not bold. You can edit it within the styles. The styles are sticking. They're still there. Are we okay on that part? I have another question. Okay. If, if, if you have it in bold, do they tell the, does the reader say in bold? Uh, that would be a Penny David question. Oh, no, it does not. It does, okay. not, um, it does not indicate font color, font stylization, a bold italic or any of that. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to come up here to my errors and it says missing object description. If I click on the first one, it's this map right here, right? And the screen reader just sees that as a blank shape. It doesn't know what's in there. So... The way that you fix that, if you, there are a couple of ways to get there, but I'm just gonna right click and go here where it says view alt text. And I'm gonna click on that. And now I have a few options. I have one option that says mark as decorative. And if I mark it as decorative, the screen reader is fine with that. That error is just gonna disappear. But if this, and I would only do that if this picture isn't important to the content of the, of the document. So maybe it's just, you know, it just looks pretty there. But if it has content that's important and that's for you to decide, I'm gonna decide that this content is important. I need to give it a description. So I can click on this, generate alt text for me and Microsoft Word will do that. So if I click here, it calls it a shape. I don't find that very um, satisfying. So I'm gonna put my own text in here. I'm gonna call this map of the United States. Whoops. Sorry about that. And that's it. So now when I close this, that disappeared. I don't have that problem anymore. It does not appear as an error. It goes to the next one. I have one more thing that I need to do on this picture. And it is this, when you have pictures, you need to put them in line with text. They need to be marked that way. If I do a different kind of text wrapping, for example, maybe I'll do, um, I don't know, uh, maybe I'll do square. 
Um, there we go. And then if I do square, I can move this up here and have the text go around the picture. You never want to do that because that's going to interrupt the screen reader. So it has to go this map of the United States will take map of the United States. You don't want to do that. So always mark your images in line with text. Um, and once you do that, you can move the picture around. So if you like in this one here, it's in line with text and I can choose to put it in the center, to the left, to the right, that's up to me, but it's still in line with text. Okay, okay so far? Just I'm gonna just keep going until somebody stops me. The next error is this one. It says doc shape group two. So there's a bunch of things here and the screen reader can't sort all of that out. I'm gonna turn my paragraph marker on for this one because there's a lot of stuff going on. So one thing is just this box here. This is problematic. Oh, I gotta grab it. Ah, there it is. Sorry about that. Anyway, there, there is a box there that shouldn't be there. And so you wanna take your text out of that. So I've done that on this side. I've removed that box. I didn't retype everything. I just copied and pasted the text here and then I formatted it. Um, here, again, I this has not been formatting with, formatted with styles. I formatted this with styles. So I've got my heading level. Um, and then this picture here is um, <clears throat> also a problem. So I put the picture here, I put it in line with text and I've given it alt text. So it's a picture of a Native American. I just said Native American. There are some other things going on in here with the hyperlinks. So in this one, there's this itty bitty little hyperlink here, which is really hard to read. And a screen reader would read this as HTTPS colon slash slash www. And that's not very easy for the person to understand. So there are two ways to embed a hyperlink into, I'm sorry, to embed a URL to create a, um, uh, a hyperlink that is readable. If I click on this, it goes to a page called land acknowledgement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this URL here. I'm just going to highlight it and copy it. And then I'm going to highlight my text, right click, and I'm going to paste the hyperlink. Well, actually, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to go here to insert link because I want to show you what happens. OK, so what I'm doing here is I am going to insert this link here in the address box. So here is the um, here is the URL and here is the text that will display. So in the text to display, when I say OK, now my link is there. I can delete this. I don't need this anymore because it's here and it makes more sense. There's another way to do that. And this one doesn't always behave. If I go to edit hyperlink, I can do the same thing. Notice up here it says it has the um, URL. I can take out the URL and I can put in land acknowledgement. I can't spell it, but I can put it in here. And notice it looks just the same as previously. It's got the text here and the URL here. I say, okay, and now it's the same thing. It is, um, it is a URL embedded within the name of where you're going. So that's two different ways to do that. And if I, again, if I look at this hyperlink and I look at this hyperlink, if I hover, I do get that link. So it's okay for whoever's using the document. And uh, another thing down here, they said, for more information, please go to this www.c sum. I went to the link, this is the name of the page, and I embedded, I, I embedded the URL into the name of the page. Here it says, um, for the for the image, Lucenio Nation, and then it's got this uh, URL. I did the same thing here. I named the image, and then I embedded the URL within within this link, and it's in there. And again, all of these things are in the documents that um, that we're going to give to you. I have a quick question for Penny. How is that red? 
on the screen reader? The URLs? Yeah. It uh, reads it as a link to. So it would say link to, uh, please go to link to California India Culture and Sovereignty Center. Okay. And then the screen reader would give them an option to open or not open. And I think one of the key things to remember as well is, you know, and, and Portia, is this, this is a great, you know, your things are being simplified in terms for a screen reader, but screen readers are highly modifiable, if that's a word. Um, the users get so used to it and they create their kind of own abilities to um, manage how their screen reader behaves. And it's pretty incredible to listen to someone that has a full, you know, they're they're blind, but they can listen and follow materials like this, listening at a speed of, you know, 600 words a minute. And uh, I watched somebody do that uh, years ago. It was just fascinating. But the documents have to be well formatted for them to be able to navigate that quickly. So this is just a really nice example of taking all of the same information as there. It's providing the equivalent learning experience. Nothing is missing from that process of making this section um, accessible. And I also um, will show you a little bit later. You can, rather than um, to create space, you can use your line spacing rather than what they've had to do here with this paragraph, 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 paragraph. And I'm going to show you that a little bit later as well. Um, so my next doc shape group. Mm. This one's a mess. It's got all kinds of stuff there. And look at this. That's going to be really, does it say paragraph, paragraph, Penny, or does it say enter, 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 enter? It says paragraph. Paragraph. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to close this just so we have more room, but there's a lot of stuff going on in here. So you've got these extra, like this was just put there so that they could hold the picture in place, which um, is problematic. So the first thing I did was to remove that. And then again, I just copy and pasted the text. I didn't type everything all over again. I use styles for my headings. And then um, I took this picture and I formatted it properly in line with text and I gave it alt text. My opinion is that this picture is pretty important. There's a lot of information in it. So when I created the alt text, I fully described it. I said, First Amendment gives citizens a freedom of religion, press, speech, assembly, and petition so that the screen reader will read all of that information. <laughs> And so all of this, I accomplished the same thing just by what I did here, by my line spacing. So if I go up to paragraph and I go to line spacing, indents and line spacing, I put 24 points after this. And look at what happens if I reduce that. For example, if I take this down to six, that image moves up. And if I take it up to 36, that image moves down. So you can accomplish this spacing just by setting how much space you want between the last piece of written information and the picture. And you can do the same thing here. Um, again, in the clip art down here, the really great thing that they did in this document that I love is they credited the pictures and people don't always do that. Remember your images, you have to use copyright free images or have um, the permission to use them. So in here, again, they gave the URL. I, um, I embedded it here, First Amendment graphic, and I embedded it here. Portia? Yeah. On that particular image, when you went and looked at that uh, at its source, did it have a license associated with it of any type or was it? Uh, just saying free to use. I got it from here. Okay. Can you pop that into the chat? I yeah. just want to go quick peek. Do that. Cool. Thank you. I got to find my chat now, though. There it is. <laughs> I got too many things open. I get confused. Thank you. You're going to check it, Penny? Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, so as we go on, so here, you know, we, we tell people all the time, mm, don't use charts. Charts are better for data, not for information. But sometimes they're actually okay. 
But this one, I'm going to turn that accessibility checker back on again. And Margaret, if I'm going too long, let me know and we'll flip over. I don't know that we'll be able to finish everything. Um, it's going to be another. This is good. I think it's good. Okay. We still have, we have a problem with this one. So again, I took out all this extra formatting that was not necessary. I used, a, um, I used styles for this. And then in this chart, if you want to know how a chart's going to read, put your cursor in and then just keep hitting tab. So this is exactly how the screen reader is going to read this. And for this one, that's probably okay. But if there were more columns, um, more information, it would be more difficult for the person listening. So with charts, um, with tables, what you should do is set this first row as a header row. And when you set it as a header row, the person using the screen reader has the option of having these two titles read for everything. So it would read amendment, first amendment, summary, freedom of speech, amendment, second amendment, summary, freedom to bear arms. In this chart, that's probably not necessary, but I'll show you another one where it's more important. It's, it's easy to set a header row. You can just um, you can just highlight it, go to table properties, and then when you go to table properties, go to row and repeat as header row. Usually you have this one checked, allow to break across page, uncheck that and check repeat as header row. And now it, it will read as a header row for every um, cell if that's what the person listening wants. But it will also, let's say that this was a super long chart and went on to the next page, it would, well, where'd that come from? It would repeat that row um, at the top of the next page. So, um, so, so again, if the information makes sense in a table, you can leave it there but you need to um, make sure that you put the header row in there. There's another way to do that. You can do it in this case, turn off my paragraph markers. You can do the same kind of thing by making two columns of information. Now you don't wanna use columns because if I had, I could easily set this up using columns, but then it's gonna say amendment, first amendment, second amendment, third amendment, summary, freedom, freedom, freedom. I don't want it to do that. I want it to say amendment, summaries, first amendment, freedom of speech. So um, I have two practice sections over here. If you look at the document that's not accessible, a lot of times people will just use the space bar to line things up the way they want them. But this is going to read space, 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 and that's very annoying. So we're going to use tab stops to create horizontal columns. And there are two ways to do that. Um, that are not that hard. I'm going to start with this way. I'm going to highlight everything, and then I'm going to go to um, I'm going to go to paragraph, and I'm going to go to tabs, and I'm going to put a tab stop position. I want there to be I want this tab to stop. Let's say at two and a half inches. I'll put two point five in here, and I'm going to set it and say okay. So now when I put my cursor here. I can tab and it's going to move it over to that point if it works. Sometimes it changes its mind. And I'll turn off my paragraph marker. And you have two columns that the screen reader can read across. There's another way to do that. And that's to use this little thing up here. These are tab stops. You see this little L, it's really tiny but that is a left tab stop. And you can put that someplace. And then the um, when you begin typing, everything will type to the left of this tab. So all I have to do is make sure that this is here. And then I put it where I want it. And I want it right here at 2.5 inches. So now when I click into my document and tab, everything will tab to that point. And if I don't want it anymore, I can just drag it off and it disappears. Or I can set it someplace else and it moves to that position. So that's kind of a fun little thing. And so if I click through here, it has other options, but I'm just using the left one for now. And for whatever reason, it disappears and you have to keep clicking till you get it again. There, no. There it is. 
Uh, we're going to turn paragraph back on for this one. This has a lot going on, and we're going to go to review and check accessibility. Um, again, we have this box that we don't need. I've taken that out. I've put in headings, but this one has lines. And if you look at this document, every time I click on line, that's like a picture. You either have to mark that as decorative or tell the screen reader what it is. And in this case, it's just put there for spacing. And I find it really annoying to have to go back and mark all of these um, as, as uh, decorative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove these lines and I'm going to use tab stops and underline to make my lines. And for whatever reason, this was already done that way, but these were lines. A really hard thing to do is to grab these lines once you're trying. There it is. Oops, I had it. There it is. I can delete this line. And I'm going to move this back. And I'm going to set a tab stop. So I'm going to go again into paragraph. And tabs. I'm going to clear all these out. And I want my tab, I want my line to be at three, for example. I'm going to set it and say OK. And now I have to make sure that my underline is turned on. And now when I hit tab, I get a nice line. And I can go through and do that for every, every line. You notice that it disappears. Once I've taken that out, it will disappear. And I don't know, the tab sometimes sticks, sometimes doesn't. It's not my, this is not my forte. Portia? Yeah. Can I make a recommendation? I would love it, Penny, because this is just so glitchy. Go back, go back up to your paragraph where you were um, choosing to, your tab stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, open that up. <clears throat> okay, now here, you see where you have your tab stop position and your default stops. Mm -hmm. Down at the bottom, it has a section called leader. Yes. Choose number four. And you don't have to worry then about your underline being marked. Perfect. Yeah. That's so, okay. That explains why sometimes it's turned on and sometimes it's turned off. Yep. Mm -hmm. Got it. Perfect. Okay. Well, let's do a tab here. Let's try that. So here we are. Uh, we're going to do again. I'm going to clear all these. And I'm going to set my tab at three. And I'm going to put four like that. Yep. Okay. And tab. Beautiful. Penny. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> so this is, yeah. Penny has been my uh, my tutor, and she's taught me so many things, and I did not know. I kept playing with that leader and did not know what it was. So that's fabulous. Um, just, I think this is the last thing. Here's another um, table. This one's a little bit harder because there are more sections. So you definitely want a header row here. So again, you would just highlight this and then go to paragraph. Uh, up here, go to paragraph. Oh, I'm sorry, no, go to table properties and uncheck this, check this, and now you have a header row. And the last thing is this one. This one, we don't need all those paragraph markers, I'll turn those off. This one is really hard to read because, again, if we tab through this, this is exactly how it's going to read. So it'll be president, vice president, secretary, secretary, right name, right name, right name, right name. This one would be a much better layout if we flip the information, put the positions here and the names here. So now it's going to say position, name, President of the United States, and then whatever you write in here, Vice President of the United States. And again, the screen reader can read these. So you can put that, write that name here, and the screen reader will read it. And um, you could also put that, like if you wanted to put that here, write the name here. You could put that here. And if you wanted to, you could make that text white. And now it's not going to show for the person using the document, but it will show for the screen reader. And that's it. All right, we had a question in the chat that Penny answered. Thank you. It's how will the screen reader read those underlines? And Penny said it's... Um, she thinks that it reads as tab stop without reference to the underline. Okay. 
Thank you, Penny, for answering questions in the background. That's great. Thanks so much. <laughs> uh, any questions about Microsoft Word before we move on? And again, I will drop those documents in the chat for you. Yeah, the thing, well, the thing I was wondering, because I actually met with some OTAN people on this on, you know, that blank, blank cell in a table, because I do use tables occasionally, but always had a rows and always, you know, minimalize it. Da, but the blank cell thing, as far as, like you said, people who are using the document on paper, they need that cell to be able to write the answer. And then people seeing it online, well, some screen, some screen readers will say blank cell and some won't. So, right. um, yeah, if you're saying I can just type in, you know, right answer here or something like that and then make it white, that's like a perfect solution. I didn't even know about that. one. So thank you. Yeah, I don't know what happens when your students use that as an electronic document with white text, but if you give them print copy, they're not going to see that. Yeah, and that's exactly what I need is a document that works for both rather than, re you know, doing everything twice. Yeah. Um, the that, other thing I've done is actually create the picture of the line and I label it white line. Yeah. I alt text it. Uh huh. Portia, thank you so much. I'm going to, we need to move on to Microsoft Word if we can now. Um, let me see if I can get my PowerPoint back up. Hmm. <laughs> For some reason, it's not. Oh, there we go. I think that's it. Can you all see this now? And it, it is an edit mode so that I can show you some of these things, but we're gonna talk quickly about um, most uh, you know, common issues and tips from Microsoft PowerPoint. And again, we have this PowerPoint to share if, if people need it. Um, Google Classroom is where a lot of agencies now have their documents and slides. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about that. Um, how to convert to Microsoft to make um, the accessibility checker available. Uh, we're going to talk about copyright issues, royalty-free images, and alt text. Again, uh, accessibility checker, um, which Portia talked about a bit. And then we're going to talk about uh, how to rectify errors in reading order and titles, which is a big thing in Microsoft PowerPoint. So when we're working with Google Classroom slides, we'll need to convert those into Microsoft PowerPoint. So um, they're a great way to share with your teachers through Google Classroom. And again, um, that's good. Uh, what the problem is with Google, it doesn't easily have an accessibility checker, whereas PowerPoint does, okay? So um, we're going to show you quickly, show you how to convert Google Slides into PowerPoint. We just take um, your Google Classroom slide, you open it up with your slides that's ready to convert. You go to the top ribbon where it says file, click download and choose Microsoft PowerPoint. Let me just show you that really quickly. Can you all see this Google Doc? It's a Google slide called EL Civics. Are you seeing that? Yes. Okay. So um, reporting in absence is a, a common EL Civics, <laughs> uh, one that I was working with an agency on, uh, but I needed to use it in PowerPoint so I could check. So I just go up to file and you go to download and you can download in many ways, but I need Microsoft PowerPoint. Click on that and it easily um, will download it for you. And you can uh, save that document. And later you can put it back into Google Classroom. I don't know if the accessibility will stay the same, but I, I believe it does, okay. Um, I have a Loom video to remind you of how to do that if you are lost. But um, it's pretty easy. Uh, copyright issues. Um, it's very important to stay away from commercially licensed materials if you're going to share on the EL Civics Exchange because we want to be able to share alike. In other words, we can't um, use commercially 
licensed materials. So you have to look at what your current materials are. Like here's a picture of a slide that an agency sent to me. And these pictures did not look like they made those pictures. So I had to ask them, are they original or did you get them from a software program or a textbook? And yes, they did. So you have to take those out of your presentation. Maybe you can look at the pictures, maybe do something similar yourself, but not exactly because it's not original otherwise, okay? We need to use royalty-free pictures and clip art. So for instance, this picture over here on the right, I got that from Noun Project, which is my favorite um, place to go, but I'll show you that. And the alt text for that, uh, sorry, I need to move your pictures, um, is actually from um, Noun Project, um, but I changed it a little bit to show that it's um, not okay. <laughs> with an X. So you could do that with clip art or you could do it with a photo. And then again here, you know, you have to do alt text as well. And on here you have to do alt text. So everything, all the pictures need to be original or royalty free. Okay. How do we do that? Well, we get royalty free um, from many different sources. My favorite is Noun Project because they have icons that are very simple and they also have pictures. Pixabay, Pexels, they all have pictures as well. And Openverse is the former Creative Commons image search. So um, these are all available on the EL Civics Exchange under resources. There's links there as well. Okay. And let me just show you, uh, I think. Um, Portia showed you already how to do alt text, but basically um, you click on the picture, right click, go to view alt text. And this is the one that was generated by Noun Project, but I see that there's a little uh, grammar error. So I might add call outdoors or just that's not really necessary. I might erase that doesn't matter, okay? Um, I am attributing it to Noun Project and who the photographer was. So that's still there, okay? Now, uh, accessibility checker in PowerPoint, very similar to Word. You just go up to the review tab, click on that, go to check accessibility, and you'll see um, there's a couple things to, to work on. Warnings uh, is not quite as important, but we have two things that we do need to be att attentive to. We need to look at any errors that we see. And typical errors in PowerPoint are every slide has to have a unique title. And then make sure that every picture or clip art has alt text. Check the re reading order. That's, that's important in Word. And to do that, you just go up to the reading order pane. When you're in review, check accessibility. You'll see this reading order pane at the top on the ribbon. And you click on that and you can see the reading order. The reading order here is out of line. What's wrong with it? Can anyone tell me? You can unmute. First. Say it again. Title needs to be first. Thank you. So I'm going to just simply move it up. Um, for some reason, it doesn't want to go up. There we go. Um, what about the subtitle? Where should that go? Second. Second would be a good idea. And then we have the content and the picture. Okay. We could have the picture before the content if you want. I don't think the picture is that important because it's just showing order. But, you know, it's up to you. We may not even need the picture. It's just um, sometimes we like graphics in our uh, PowerPoints. So that's why I did that. 
Any questions on that? Pretty easy to check the reading order. And then you can click it, you know, off, and then you're back to accessibility. Looks oh. pretty good. There is one error, but we'll get to that. Okay. We do need to have a unique title for every slide. So in order to do that, we go to outline view, view, tab, outline view. And it's great. It shows you all the titles and all the content for each slide. So it's wonderful. So then um, add a unique title to each slide. You can either type it in here. I'm showing you one here. So we could type in a title. Okay, it's a demo slide, so I'm just showing you this is where you would do it. You can type it in over here, or you can type it in on the slide itself. And content, you can type in on the left side as well, if you would like. It's up to you. Okay. Sometimes, uh, I'm going to get out of here, go back to normal so you can see it better. Sometimes we have slides. Uh, we often like to have slides that show blanks. And then students are supposed to fill in those missing words, you know, in class when we're showing the PowerPoint. And then we want, we don't want to give them the answer yet, but then later we want to give them the answer. So we just copy and paste those slides, but they seem to have the same title. So you just need to change the slide title that shows the answer. Maybe you want to say answer, or you could say 2A, 2B to see like that as the title, or you can uh, make the font so faint that you can't really read it, but a screen reader could. So we could change that, okay? Any questions on that? Well, you guys are good. No questions. Okay. Um, just want to give you a few more accessibility resources and there's a lot on the EL civics exchange itself. Let me go there and show you. So on this page on EL civics, that's the opening page. You have a little button up here called resources and the resources page has a lot of great resources that are on, which some are videos, some are just websites. So you can go to those, get lots of background information, find, you know, open source pictures and more about 501 compliant, 508 compliance, things like that. And then to go back to the main page, just click the logo and you're back to the main page. And this is where you begin the submission process. Any questions about that? Okay. If you ever have questions, you can always email us. And that gets to Lori, to Portia, to me, whoever's working with EL Civics. So elcivics at casas.org is our standard email. And it's really easy to go there. Okay. Hey, Margaret, can I ask a favor of you? Yes. You um, took that one Google slide deck and you yes. saved it as a PowerPoint. Can you open that PowerPoint? I'd like to see Oh, something. open the PowerPoint? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing that screen now, I hope so. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's see what it looks like, huh? Yeah. I just uh, be sure to enable it. Yep, up there. Run your um, <clears throat> accessibility checker. checker. Yeah. And don't be shocked. <laughs> okay. Yes. So that, those, three errors at the top. And when you start seeing those numbers, 133 and 118, 
Um, this is a key point, in my opinion, because you can do this, but if you drop down that list for missing object description uh, on your checker, yeah, just drop it down. So you see how that says Google shape, Google shape, Google shape? Mm -hmm. That's because Google does not recognize, um, my, or Microsoft does not recognize Google stock. So if you click on one of those, so it's now it picked up one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what what I find with this is that okay, I know this is an image, and I'm gonna have to probably go through and check my reading order because that's what it'll tell me to do. If you drop down that triangle next to Google Shape in your object description missing object description, drop down that arrow. So now it wants a description, and what I want to see is if I can rename that. Um, so click add a description. I can't do it here. So the alt text with you know the graphic showing a phone or reporting yeah. apps absences or whatever, right? Uh-huh. So let's go back to the list. I don't know if I can do this or not. I'm 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 using you as a guinea pig. Can you right click on that first one at the top? See, I don't know. Can you just type in there text box? Try to type text box. Yep. No, nothing happens. So th this is why, you know, trying to take things out of Google into PowerPoint, <clears throat> because with, when you were showing how to check your reading sequences before, yeah. each thing was marked very well. So you knew it was a title, it was a subtitle, it was content. Uh-huh. Now you're not going to have that ability, right? Well, because... Ah. You, the only way you know it is by clicking on it. I can't tell from number one, Google Shape, is that reporting an absence or is that something else? Well, when we look at outline view, we can see there are no titles here at all. So that's a big wow. problem. That's a big problem. Yeah, it's huge. Big yeah, and problem. that's why the advocacy for using Microsoft because it's already built in. Now, I, I did post in the chat that Google does have an extension called Grackle but it costs an agency to use it. Um, it's not free, which is unfortunate. It might be in the future, but right now, and I've been working with Melinda Holt at OLTAN about seeing how does some of those conversions take place. I'm told I'm gonna to be given a license so I can play with it and then maybe give you some, some hip, you know, tips and stuff about how to get that to work, um, pulling it over into Microsoft, because to me, that would, as an instructor, that would be so daunting to see that kind of report trying to convert a slide deck out of Google. Yeah, this is why it's really good to start fresh if you can yeah. and yeah. just see what was already done, but then make it better. But right. start, in, start in Word or start in PowerPoint and go from there. Yeah. Um, and Benny, and if, if you of, had access to Grapple, you wouldn't have to download them into Word. You could just keep them as Google Docs, right? Right, but I think doesn't the exchange require them to be in Microsoft yeah. because of the ability to edit? Oh, the sharing. Or PDF. The sharing. Or PDF, yeah. 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 So I mean, if we could just find a cleaner way to convert those Google products over to Microsoft, that isn't such a heavy lift to, to make them accessible. But in, in fact, that's how you find out how you really look and see if those pictures are open source or not. Um, yeah. Uh, so things like that. And we're very heavy into graphics mm -hmm. in our instructional materials. It's just a necessity when you're doing ESL and ABE. So well, you guys are doing such a terrific job of getting the word out to the field. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the exchange grow over time and providing more and more of those resources. You guys have been at this for a long time, trying to get this exchange put together. So it's kind of cool. So it's getting it. there. It's getting there. Sandra, do you have any questions for us? Um, no, I just I just had a comment that mm -hmm. um, struck me when you talked about graphics. You know, in ESL, we use so many graphics. And I can tell you, as a curriculum writer, I spend half my time finding or making graphics to make sure that they are, you know, usable, you know, I mean, a Pixabay is like my favorite thing because no attribution necessary, although it's nice to do it. Um, so yeah, finding these sites. And like I said, there's a lot of stuff that's 
I'm working on workplace safety right now. And you ever tried to find free graphics for that one? I'm making yeah, go, go to I'm Noun Project. Making. You will find I'm, stuff. Okay. Yeah, I'm making really a lot. Nice. Yeah. Noun Project. I like my favorite one. Like you have to register. And what if I get the attribution wrong? And, you know. No, so I just fine. go to basic download and, you know, yeah. you just have a free account. It's easy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And but it yeah, actually is gives you huge, the attribution. And a huge part of the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It is, especially with those beginning level um, EL Civic stuff. Yeah. But it's important. It's kind of fun. Why don't, you, why don't you get your, you know, the basics? It's kind of fun. We're used to just downloading, you know, any picture we want from Google, you know, and it's not, it's not cool. Yeah, those days are gone. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, I do have fun making the graphics. You oh, know, good. but like you said, with beginners, you know, like workplace safety, you have to make it really obvious. I had to find a woman with long hair who was working and then put her in a kitchen and then, you know. Well, sometimes you can do it at your own job site. You know, if you know kind of what the picture yeah. you want, you know. Yeah, and they'll want photo releases and everything else. I'm like, yeah. yeah. True, you have to have picture releases, photo releases. But that's why I'm hoping you get more stuff on the exchange. So it's like, okay, where'd you find your graphics? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, works. Margaret, and she found it on Noun, Noun Project. <laughs> oh yeah, it's fun. It's fun to look for, um, you know, free stuff. So, uh, open resource. And All right, there, Sandra. Too, there's a lot of other um, sources for images, and if you're looking, you you said you're working for a workplace right now. Um, ages ago, I found some resources through the, like for construction trades, it was the tool people and they were happy to provide images if you gave them credit for it. Now, this was a long time ago, so I can't say that that's true anymore, but I had a, a CTE construction guy that, um, you know, he was using like safety videos from DeWalt. And they were available to him at no cost because it was promoting their product. So, you know, there are ways sometimes to get around that when you're when you're really narrow in what you're looking for. Um, and it still takes time. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to save time, but it may provide you a richer resource for what you're looking for um, in, in your materials that you're creating. No, that's a good idea because we have CTE classes in a lot of areas. So if I could, um, yeah, and I know the head of CTE, so he could hook me up with the teachers. And there's a also with um, I don't think it was with Pixels. There, there's another one, and if I can find it, I'll get it to Margaret and Portia, um, and maybe I can add it to their resource list where you can request photos or images that somebody will go and do for you at no cost because they will license them under Creative Commons um, as they, and if I find it, I'll tell you. I used it once where it was like, I need <laughs> images of, uh, you know, and people doing uh, gestures and emotions. So I found a favorite artist that she just took all these pictures where she was like contemplative. So she was like this, like angry. <laughs> But you should, you'd have all of these images uh, that you could then, you know, they have transparent background and very easy to use. So I will try to find that for you, Sandra, because it'll save you in the long run. <laughs> Thanks, Penny. Yeah. Remind me, Portia, but I'll get it to you. <laughs> thank you so much for all your uh, assistance, Penny. It's been great. And thank you, Q, for, for helping us. Sandra, in the beginning, I would send something that I thought was accessible to Penny, and I would get back a four-page essay on why it wasn't. <laughs> All righty, ladies. Well, I learned so much. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we appreciate your time today, and oh, have fun with the rest of the conference today. <laughs>